Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, to the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Lord, you sent the Holy Spirit to instruct the hearts of the faithful. By the same Spirit, help us to relish what is right, and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I would like to welcome uh, Joseph Pierce, who is going to be talking on our Catholic saints of the, I hate to use the word Reformation, generally speaking, but during those very difficult times in the 16th century in Europe. And so, uh, uh, please, uh, Joseph, uh, come up and uh, do what you do. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's very good to be back here um, at St. Joseph's, my second visit. Last time it was, I think, Shakespeare, was it not? So we're basically staying in the same period, um, 16th century. But now we're going to be talking about saints of the Catholic Reformation, or as the title of my book, Heroes of the Catholic Reformation. So I'll say something at the moment about heroism and holiness. But the first thing I want to do is to, is to talk about our understanding of the past. I don't know if I mentioned this last time I was here, but I'm currently involved, uh, involved in writing a, a, a book to which I've given the provisional title, The Good, the Bad and the Beautiful. Uh, and it's a history of Christendom. And the idea is to have one chapter for each of the 20 centuries since the time of Christ and in each of those centuries to look at the good, the bad, and the beautiful. And it was inspired by some words of uh, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, when he said that uh, in the final analysis, the only defense of the Catholic Church or the great saints that she's inspired and the beautiful art that she, that's, that's been brought forth from her womb. So the goodness of the saints and the beauty of, of, of Catholic culture so that inspired me because in every generation uh, you have the good, those who are striving for holiness, the bad, those who are not striving for holiness, and the beautiful, the great works. And in every generation the, 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 the wicked have more power than the holy, or at least most of the time. Um, and for, for much of the time the, uh, the wicked are actually persecuting the holy. And in spite of all their great works of beauty are produced to edify and lift our hearts and minds to God. So one thing that the purpose of that is to get us out of the, the frame of mind that um, there was, a, first of all, that we're progressing towards a golden age in the future, but also the other idea that we, uh, that there was a golden age in the past. Because in every generation, these three dynamics, basically homo viatum, pilgrim man who's trying to get to heaven, homo superbus, proud man who makes himself God and does not try to get to heaven, and anthropos, he, he who looks up in wonder and sees beauty and makes beautiful things. So we look at the 16th century, because again we tend to think, wow, the 21st century is, is a really bad time. You know, but if you, if you understand history, there have been plenty of really bad times. Uh, and the 16th century was one of them. And so I, the, I first called Heroes of the Catholic Reformation, because there's more than one Reformation in the 16th century, as we shall see. But I want to say something before we move on to that about heroism and holiness. 
Because there seems to be there are two types of heroism. There's the heroism of the moment that you might have in the battlefield, where there's great courage shown in a particular moment at a particular time. That's heroism. Rare displays of courage. And there's the other heroism, which is much deeper. That heroism is not for a passing moment, but is for a lifetime. Where we're, that, that heroism where we're trying to sacrifice ourselves heroically for our neighbours and for our God in every single day of our lives. That heroism is called holiness, and that's a deeper, deeper heroism than the heroism of the moment. So that's, that's why I call this Heroes of the Catholic Reformation. It is about saints who renewed the church, to give it the, the book its subtitle here. But the first thing you have to realise is there are not, there's not one Reformation, we usually say the Reformation. From a Catholic perspective, there are three Reformations. First of all, there are two separate uh, revolutions against the Church that have gone by the name of Refor Reformation, two revolts. So again, there's not one Protestant Reformation, there's two. There's the Protestant Reformation started by Luther, continued by people such as Calvin on the continent, which was largely a theological uh, dispute with the Catholic Church, although many German princes and others took advantage of it set for secular purposes. And then there was the English Reformation, which is very, very different and should not be confused with the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Because the English Reformation wasn't caused by uh, a heretical theologian such as Martin Luther, it was caused by a Catholic king who considered himself to be Catholic, who had actually written uh, a, a book called In Defense of the Seven Sacraments against Martin Luther, possibly with the help of one or other of our two saints that he would later be responsible for killing, because it's rumoured that either St Thomas More or St John Fisher helped Henry VIII in the composition of that uh, pamphlet in defence of the seven sacraments. For that pamphlet, the Pope bestowed upon Henry VIII the title of Fidei Defensor, Defender of the Faith, which ironically the kings of, of, of England still keep as a title, even though they got it from the Pope, uh, and it's, you still find that, 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 that those words, Fidei Defensor, on British coins to this day. So you see that, that King Henry VIII, who was the person who was responsible for breaking uh, with the Church of Rome, was uh, someone who despised Lutheranism. He's what we might now call a cafeteria Catholic. That he considered himself to be a Catholic, but on his own terms. And those aspects of the Church which went against what he wanted, he refused to uh, consider essential. So, so they have, and then of course we have the third reformation, which is the Catholic Reformation. It's sometimes called the Counter Reformation, and it's a fair enough title in one sense because it was countering the Reformation. But the problem with it is that it's something of a negative term, as if all that the Catholic Church was doing was reacting against the uh, Protestants, and that's a gross oversimplification, as we shall see when we look at some of these glorious saints of the 16th century. Uh, and I'm going to basically look at the ones that are covered in the book here. So, um, we'll begin in England, because you say there's three reformations, but the book starts, I'll, I'll go through the, 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 uh, the saints we talk about, because we'll be doing it probably in this order. St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More, so uh, countering the English Reformation. Ignatius Loyola and Francis Xavier, Charles Borromeo, Pope St. Pius V, Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, those who were uh, countering the like, Protestant Reformation and reforming the Catholic Church in Europe. And then we finish with uh, St. Edmund Campion and St. Robert Southern, two English martyrs um, who, um, again, were countering the English Reformation, this time during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, not Henry VIII. So this takes us through most of the 16th century. And um, the key thing here is that the English saints are all martyrs. They were put to death for the practice of the faith. 
Uh, and although the other saints we're going to mention here were persecuted some of them, they didn't suffer that fate because they were in Catholic Europe. Okay, so I'm going to begin with, with St. John Fisher, a very holy priest, um, and uh, a man who was a very austere life, even though he was very well connected. Uh, he was the tutor of Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, um, uh, was friends with members of the royal family, but lived a very simple, humble, austere life. Um, and effectively, he said himself that he was dying for the indissolubility of marriage to defend the sacrament of marriage. Because, of course, the reason that Henry VIII um, uh, broke with Rome was because he wanted to divorce his saintly wife, Catherine of Aragon. Let me say something, by the way. I often, when I talk about Catherine of Aragon, I often say Saint Catherine of Aragon and, and inadvertently canonise her. I have no right to do that, of course. Um, but she's a great favourite of mine. And when I lived in England, I used to travel quite often from Norwich in England where I lived to York in the north of England and do that by train. And if you do it by train, you change uh, trains in Peterborough. And uh, um, Margaret, um, Catherine of Aragon is buried in Peterborough Cathedral under the floor. So I would get off the train in Peterborough and make a quick pilgrimage to St. Catherine of Aragon. Uh, and would, would say a prayer uh, to her over her tomb there for England as uh, she basically uh, was persecuted greatly for her defence of the Catholic faith. So it, she had very few friends that prepared to stand up for her, St John Fisher was one of them. And when he basically refused to go along with the King's plans, he was arrested uh, and in June 1535 he was martyred. And um, I can remember, remember, I cannot look in the books, so I didn't have to take the page number down. If I remember correctly, he was actually martyred on the feast of St. John the Baptist, mm -hmm. which was a bit of a mistake on the part of the authorities because uh, the Catholics of England, and the other thing we have to understand about England at this time, the 1530s, the whole of England basically was Catholic. Unlike in parts of Switzerland, parts of France, parts of Germany, where there was an appetite for Protestantism, there was Virtually no appetite for Protestantism in England. It was a very Catholic country. What, was, what King Henry VIII did was to impose a state religion upon the English people against their will. Um, so the majority of the English people were very sympathetic to Catherine of Aragon, very sympathetic to St John Fisher and St Thomas More. They were basically on, they were the people on their side against the king. So when uh, St John Fisher was, was uh, beheaded, on the Feast of St. John the Baptist, obviously people were very quick to see the, the similarities. And there was a, a great surprise when they, they stuck St. John Fisher's head on a spike, how it retained its red hue, as if it, there was still blood, as if it was still a living uh, uh, head. So again, lots of, lots of, if you want to call it superstition, or pious, uh, um, uh, Miracles or whatever that are a result of that. Let's move on to St. Thomas More. And of course, he's much better known as St. John Fisher, which, um, you know, technically the two are celebrated side by side. And he's largely better known because um, of, in the 20th century, because of the very famous play that was made into two separate films, The Man Full Seasons. Which, uh, can you raise your hands if you've seen The Man Full Seasons? So about half. So uh, um, two two films, versions, and then obviously it was originally a play. More recently, you know, St. 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 Thomas More is, is the hero, as someone who stands up for religious liberty and political freedom against the tyrannical uh, ruler. But then we have the more recent uh, adaptations written by Hilary Mantel who despises the Catholic Church, where um, Thomas More is turned into the villain, and Thomas Cromwell, who was one of the most despicable men that ever lived, is turned into a hero. It's amazing what propaganda can do. However, there's another play on St. Thomas More, which is called Sir Thomas More, because it was written long before uh, Thomas More was canonised. 
by a group of playwrights, including a certain William Shakespeare. And I've written at length, and I can't talk about this, but I've written at length that, to suggest that Shakespeare was the principal author of the play. First of all, because he was the only Catholic amongst the other playwrights involved, um, and it's a very pro-Catholic, pro-St. Thomas More play. Um, but also, uh, I suspect he wrote it, because Shakespeare's early plays seem to have been written for Methuselahs, probably before he became famous, very early play. So William Shakespeare himself seems to have written a play, or at least at the very least, that had been a collaborator in a play on St. Thomas More. So St. Thomas More is a great scholar, a great humanist scholar, an expert on Aristotle and Boethius, um, St. Augustine. A um, very holy man, again, who uh, did not want the power that was thrust upon him by the king. First of all, because he had no uh, desire for power, but secondly, because he knew Henry VIII. Uh, and there was a, a story about once that he saw Henry VIII sort of hugging, and someone commented upon Henry VIII hugging him and, you know, and holding his head close. And Thomas More said, yes, but he would... Uh, be as quick in removing their head if, it, if I went against his designs. So, so no illusions for St. Thomas More. And of course, in the end, as with John Fisher, he stood up for the integrity uh, of uh, marriage, for the integrity of uh, the Catholic Church and the integrity of the papacy, refused to kowtow to the bullying of uh, Henry VIII and suffered the same fate as John Fisher um, of being beheaded. Now, I want to uh, just read here about um, the rest of uh, St. Thomas More, just so we've got the actual facts here. May the 16th, 1531, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, delivered to the King a document that became known as the Submission of the Clergy placing the hierarchy of the Church in England under the will and rule of the King. On the same day, Thomas More resigned as Chancellor with the excuse of ill health. For more, the King's triumph had changed the very nature of England, destroying the very legal system on which he stood and which had held the King as having authority sub Deo et Lege, under God and the law. Having declared himself head of the Church in his realm, Henry, like the Caesars of old, had effectively declared himself divine, above the laws of either God or man. He was now a law unto himself, who could and would do as he will. The rest of the, you know, I'll talk about, about the, uh, the rest of it in the previous chapter. So, um, before we move on to Thomas More, I want to say something uh, about uh, why he's a great hero and what it, what it teaches us actually about the necessity of a celibate clergy. Because what they did with Thomas More, he's still alive, they're using his family to blackmail him, his wife, his baby daughter. They begin to take all of his property away from him and hand it to his enemies, including the family of Anne Boleyn. Um, and uh, he's actually witnessing, not only is he going to effectively Sign his own death warrant by refusing to do the king's will. His, uh, his family has been plunged into penury and poverty before his very eyes before he dies. And he has them, his own family members, pleading with him to, to compromise. So, I talk, talked about how they're giving, giving the land away. But look about you know, trusting Henry VIII. It was ironic that Henry Norris and George Bolin. The, the uh, king's friends were not destined to enjoy their inheritance at More's expense, both losing their lives only a year after More's own death. George Bowley was found guilty of incest with his sister, and Norris was convicted of committing adultery with her. Both men were also condemned for treason and were imprisoned in the tower before being executed on Tower Hill on May the 17th, 1536. This is the man we're dealing with, Henry VIII, possibly on the very same block on which Moore himself had been put martyred only 10 months earlier. The ill-fated Anne Boleyn lost her head on the same block only two days later, having also been a guest of Edmund Walsingham in the Tower of London. 
Needless to say, most historians agree that the so-called plot surrounding Anne, together with the accusations of incest and adultery, were cynically fabricated by Henry in order to rid himself of another unwanted wife. Henry was now proving Lord Acton's adage that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. The situation in England, following Henry's revolution, masquerading as a reformation, proved the other adage, that revolutions devour their own children. Whether saints or sinners, conscientious objectors or gilded butterflies, nobody was safe from the machinations of the king. Um, and then I want to uh, very quickly here look at the Thomas More's final moments. So Law says in his eloquent speech after he's been condemned to death, I'm quoting him, for as much, my lords, as this indictment is grounded upon an act of Parliament directly repugnant to the laws of God and his holy church. The supreme government whereof, as any part thereof, may no temporal prince presume by any law to take upon him, as, as rightly belonging to the see of Rome, a spiritual preeminency by the mouth of our Saviour himself, personally present upon the earth, only to St. Peter and his successors, bishops of the same see, by special prerogative granted, is therefore in law among Christian men insufficient to charge any Christian men. In other words, he's been charged with an unlawful law. All right. Um, and of course, he famously dies saying that he is the king's good servant, but God's first. It takes actually a, a good servant to tell one's master when one's master is doing something wrong. A good servant is not a yes man. Now let's look at, go across to Europe. See, things are pretty bad in England, right? Things are pretty bad in England today, in the 21st century, but at the moment, at least, they're not putting Catholics to death. Go across to Europe. Things better there. Well, at the time, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, is in conflict with the German princes who are using Martin Luther as an excuse to rebel. And also the Emperor Charles V is at war with uh, King Francis I of France, one of the most powerful Catholic countries at war with the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1527, Rome was actually sacked um, and uh, Protestant mercenaries uh, defaced churches. They kidnapped Pope Clement VII and physically assault Pope Julius III, the future Pope Julius III. Two years after that, if that wasn't bad enough, there was the siege of Vienna, when a Muslim army um, from the Ottoman Empire, numbering 120,000, besieged the city of Vienna, the capital of the city of the Holy Roman Emperor. And the reason that the Ottoman Turks, the forces of Islam, to go that, get that far up into Europe was because Germany and France effectively were allies of Islam against the Emperor Charles V, the so-called Christian princes and kings allying themselves with the infidel for cynical, self-serving, Machiavellian political purposes. Thankfully, by the grace of God, a relatively small army, led by Poles mostly, of only 17,000, defeated the Muslim army of 120,000 and lifted the siege and saved Europe. And if, if that wasn't bad enough, France was also at war with Spain. Which brings us to the next two saints, St. Saint Ignatius Lola and St. Francis Xavier. And St. Francis Xavier did not like St. Ignatius uh, when he first met him, because Ignatius, uh, before his conversion, had fought for the Spanish uh, against the people of Navarre in Spain, who were allied to the French. And indeed, um, the Spanish destroyed the Francis Xavier's family home for their part in uh, that 
war. So the first time that Christ Savior met Ignatius at Loyola, it was a very frosty first meeting. But nonetheless, the two of course became great, great friends and allies and were the founding fathers, so to speak, of the Jesuit order. Um, and two very different vocations within that. St. Ignatius Loyola, of course, found, founded and built the Jesuits, who had become such a force uh, in the uh, Counter Reformation, and it did such a force in the, uh, the uh, mission to England. And the last two saints we look at in this talk will be Jesuits. So Francis Xavier, on the other hand, went out and started spreading the gospel in India and China um, uh, and was a great missionary. I thought of this St. Charles Bobber Mayer, great reformer of the church, but by the reformation of the church, it was someone who was insisting on discipline and devotion at a time of great slackness. He was a very holy bishop and he would get on his horse and would visit the far-flung regions of his archdiocese on horse, um, visiting small parishes and was uh, appalled at the decadence in the church. There were stories, certainly many stories, of priests living with concubines, um, but also of the Blessed Sacrament uh, just being neglected so that the, 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 uh, the uh, body of Christ is moulding. Um, so an absolute uh, diabolical neglect uh, and uh, slackness and lukewarmness on the part of the people. So Charles Borromeo said about um, reforming his archdiocese through personal devotion to heroism and hard work. And it was during his time that there was a play that, uh, that um, descended upon Milan much worse than anything we've suffered recently. And many of the uh, wealthy that were able to left Milan, many of the most uh, neglectful of their duties of the clergy and uh, religious orders left Milan. Charles Bromomeo, by his own example, stayed. And because of his example, the many of the clergy and the religious orders rallied, the people rallied, the people loved him. There were great stories about his heroic heroism during the play. There was one, for instance, where he was walking through the streets uh, and they heard a baby crying in an upstairs room. And the door was locked because the people with the play had locked themselves in. So he got on the ladder and climbed up to the second floor and climbed through the window and saw a baby crying between uh, its two dead parents. I can't remember the baby's a boy or girl, I don't know if they ever knew, so I said it. Um, we could have said he in the old fat inclusive way, that would have done just as well. Um, so he rescues the baby, and this inspires him to found uh, an orphanage, and the orphanage they also have a herd of goats to make sure there's enough milk. Um, so just some examples, but one very important example from my perspective as someone who studied Shakespeare is that because, of course, under these circumstances, there were not enough priests to minister to the dying, to get, to get the last rites to the dying. So what does this holy bishop do? He writes a spiritual last will and testament, which he has printed and handed around the city, and the people sign it. It's a bit like we've heard of the doctrine of baptism of desire. It's, it's like a... a, a uh, a last rites of desire, extreme unction of desire, to make it known that if no priest is available when, at, at my moment of death, this is to, uh, first of all, acknowledge my sins, it goes through various things, but of course, key, uh, I, I, I make it known that I, have, I earnestly desire that a priest could be present. So he did this as a way of sustaining, supporting his own flock. Now, there's a mystery here, a great mystery, which I think is wonderful. When I was doing my research on, on Shakespeare's Catholicism, there was a letter from uh, Aquaviva, the, the Jesuit superior general in Rome, or a letter to him, I should say, from one of the Jesuits in England, saying that could he arrange to have more of the Testament sent, because many people here desire it. 
And for many years it was thought that this must be the Douay Reims New Testament. There's two reasons why that doesn't mean true. One is practical and the other is absolute. <laughs> um, in a sense it was, it's impossible. The, the, what brings untrue is these priests in England are going around in disguise as gardeners or school teachers. Um, it's, if, they, if they're discovered, they are imprisoned, tortured, and then put to gruesome death. The very thought that they be carrying large volumes of the Catholic New Testament with them does not ring true. It would be suicide. But also, if you look at the date of this letter to uh, the Superior General Akrodeva, uh, it actually predates the publication of the first edition of the Douay Rheims Bible by several months. And they are, he's asking for more copies. So it's not possible. So what are these testaments? Well, in the mid-1700s, mid so almost 150 years after Shakespeare's death, they renovated Shakespeare's family home in Stratford upon Avon, and in the rafters of the roof, they come across the spiritual last will and testament, signed by Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare. It's ex exactly the same wording as the, the St. Charles Borromeo will. So clearly, in England, there's the same need, not because of the, the, the plague, but because of another plague, the plague of Protestantism, if you want to call what's happening in England by this time Protestantism, but certainly anti-Catholic tyranny. Again, Catholics could not be sure of having a priest available for them at death. So they, they, these tests would be handed out and signed, one of them by Shakespeare's own father, John. Let's now move on to another great saint, St. Pius V, a personal favourite of mine, and I'm going to begin with some famous lines from a poem by G.K. Chesterton. This is from Chesterton's poem, Le Panto. They have dared the white republics up the capes of Italy, they have dashed the Adriatic round the lion of the sea, and the Pope has cast his arms abroad for agony and loss, and called the kings of Christendom for swords about the cross. This is St. Pius V, who basically called for Christian unity in the face of a huge Islamic armada that was set to sail upon Europe. And uh, again, if, the, if this armada was not stopped, there was every possibility that St. Peter's Basilica in Rome would go the same way as Hagia Sophia in Constantinople and become a mosque. So how do, the, how do the rulers of Christendom respond to this imminent threat to the very future of Christendom itself? Well, I could read more Chester's poem, but the cold Queen of England is looking in the glass, says Chesterton. Queen Elizabeth I, the Pope's the enemy, not Islam. And the, 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 the Valois, the, the, the de facto ruler of France, is too decadent to care. The German princes uh, are at war with the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor is more concerned about that. Spain has its eyes on the New World and all the gold it can get from the New World. Nobody's there to defend Christendom from this imminent threat from Islam. Pius V forms the Holy League, and Don John of Austria lead, he becomes the lead, leader of this Holy League. And they, a, a fleet basically raised by the Pope is assembled, outnumbered, but as with the siege of Vienna half a century earlier, proves triumphant. Over his, the, this was the largest naval battle since before the time of Christ, fought in the Mediterranean, Lepanto. The church today, you may not know this, but the, the, when we celebrate the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, that feast was instituted by St. Pius V to celebrate the victory at Lepanto. It was originally called Our Lady of Victory, until the Catholic Church got shy about being victorious. <laughs> but if ever we called it Our Lady of Victory or Our Lady of the Rosary, that feast day we celebrate every year. Um, 
is a consequence of that naval victory which was, which, for which we all have some part fifth to thank for the saving of Europe from Islam. Let's move on. St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. These great founders of this house, Carmelites. Um, again, it's very difficult to talk about ecstasies and, you know, uh, or miracles because when you try to do so, the la language is not equal to it. It takes great poetry a great poetic prose to even come close to conveying the miraculous nature of an ecstatic union with God, which St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross enjoy. St. John of the Cross's poetry is brilliant and beautiful in the way that it at least endeavours to convey that. So you haven't read the poetry of St. John of the Cross, I suggest that you do. And I suggest you do it in the translation of the great Catholic convert poet Roy Campbell. And I'll say more about him in just a moment. But let's, um, before I go on to St. John of the Cross, let's, let's look at these wonderful lines of poetry by um, Richard Crayshaw about St. Teresa of Avila. Richard Crayshaw, by the way, very interesting stories. His father was a Puritan, and not just a Puritan, but a Puritan extremist who basically attacked Shakespeare attacked the theatre for being papist, obviously attacked the Catholic Church for being papist, but attacked music for being papist, um, and really he saw uh, beauty as uh, the work of the devil. One of the great divine, paradoxical, providential irony, his son Richard Crashaw converts to Catholicism, and in consequence is really forced into exile and, and into poverty, and he dies in Italy. Um, at Loretto, the shrine to Our Lady at Loretto is where he dies. But let's listen to this wonderful poem he writes uh, about St. Teresa of Avila. O thou undaunted daughter of desires, by all thy dower of lights and fires, by all the eagle in thee, all the dove, by all thy lives and deaths of love, by thy large drops of intellectual day, and by thy thirst of love more large than they, by all thy, thy brim-filled bowls of fierce desire, by thy last morning's draught of liquid fire, by the full kingdom of that final kiss that seized thy parting soul and sealed thee his, by all the heaven thou hast in him, fair sister of the seraphim, by all of him we have in thee, leave nothing of myself in me. Let me so read thy life that I, unto all life of mine, may die. Perfect example here, there, of the way that St. Teresa of Avila inspires sanctity in others. Well, John of the Cross, for his devotion to the cross and to the reforming of the Carmelite order, was imprisoned by the Carmelites for eight months, lived in solitary confinement, was treated appallingly, was not actually released. Even after eight months, he escaped. So again, you think things are bad in the world or in the church, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> and let's say one other thing, by the way, just to put this into real context, the whole template for the history of the church and the history of the world is set in the passion of Christ. One eighth of those who follow Christ are Judas. Ten eight, ten, sorry, Ten twelfths are cowards who run away when the going gets tough. One eighth have the courage to stand by our Lord and Saviour even at the crucifixion. That's basically the template. Don't expect any more than one eighth to be saints. That doesn't mean only one eighth is saved, by the way. I'm not a 
Calvinist. <laughs> Not for me to judge who's going to be saved. But the point is that this is that what happens in the pattern of the story of the Passion of the Christ is a pattern that is played out in every generation thereafter, including the 16th century as in the 21st century. Let me tell you a story about the 20th century about St. John of the Cross, however, before we go on. I'm realising as a salesman I'm, I'm, I'm not very good because I wrote a biography of Roy Campbell and I'm talking about him and I didn't bring any copies of the book to sell, so there we are. But what a miserable failure, I'm loser I am. <laughs> but Roy Campbell was a convert to the Catholic faith, a great poet of the 20th century. He converted to Catholicism with his wife and two daughters after they moved to Spain. They moved to Spain in 1934, uh, which was uh, where there were anarchist uprisings and revolutions in both Barcelona, where they were staying. So they left Barcelona because it was a dangerous place to raise two young daughters and moved down the coast to a small village called Altia. And they fell so much in love with the Catholic way of life, with the countryside, the peasants, the customs, the liturgical year. They were received into the church by the local priest, Father Gregorio. Then they moved to Toledo, the ancient capital of Spain. And while they were there, they befriended the Carmelite monks of Toledo. Um, Roy Campbell's wife, Mary, a very saintly woman, became a third order Carmelite, went to Mass daily. And they befriended the Carmelites, and one of the Carmelite uh, friars became their um, personal confessor. And then the Civil War begins in Spain. And the communists, of course, are very anti catholic and burning churches and killing uh, priests. So the Carmelites asked Roy Campbell if, if they could give him the uh, archives of St. John of the Cross, because they sensed that when the communists arrived, that the, the library could be burned down and, and, and they would lose these priceless these price artifacts of St. John of the Cross. So Roy Campbell says, of course, and so the trunk containing the archives is moved to the Campbell's house in Toledo. A few days later, the communists arrive and uh, the library is burned down, the monastery is burned down, and Roy Campbell discovers 13 of the monks lying dead on the streets having been shot in cold blood. They've been canonized recently by the church. Then the communists raid Roy Campbell's house. There's a lot of Amusing story that Roy Campbell tells. The communist in his house, he's worried about the fate of his wife and two children, his two daughters. One of his daughters is sitting on the trunk that contains the archives of St. John of the Cross. And apparently, these ignorant communists come in and they see a volume of the Divine Comedy on uh, the shelf. And of course, this is the 1930s, and Mussolini, the fascist, is in, in ruling Italy. So these, these, these communists say, Dante, fascist. So Campbell thinks, this is dangerous, they're this ignorant, they're gonna shoot me because I've got a copy of Dante on my shelf. So very quickly, he points to a volume of Dostoevsky. <laughs> Dostoevsky, Russian, are you safe? <laughs> and then he prays to St. John of the Cross. And he says that if his family has spared their lives, in thanksgiving, he would translate the poetry of St. John of the Cross into English. And they do survive. The archives of St. John of the Cross survive, and Roy Campbell is good to his promise. And his poetry translations of the poetry of St. John of the Cross are absolutely marvellous. It's very rare that, that the translation of poetry into one language into another is successful. Because as T.S. Eliot said, between the potency and the existence falls the shadow. Between the power of the original and the existence of the translation, a shadow falls. But Roy Campbell manages to turn beautiful Spanish poetry into beautiful English poetry, conveying these uh, ecstatic mystical visions of St. John of the Cross. Okay, let's move back for the final part of the talk to England, to two great Jesuit martyrs. In fact, there'll be another martyr because by far this will be best. I'm going to introduce someone else. It's a great favourite of mine too. So, St. Edmund Campion, he's raised a Protestant, he's brilliant, there are absolutely, the obvious parallels is, is between Edmund Campion and St. John Henry Newman. 
both based at Oxford, both seem to be brilliant, both have great gifts of rhetoric, rhetoric and learning, both have great charisma, both have great personal followings of people who basically watch and follow everything they say and do. And both, of course, incur, incur the wrath of the establishment when they become Catholics. The difference is, of course, that in, although St. John Henry Newman took a lot of flack from the anti-Catholic establishment in England, he wasn't going to be put to death. St. Edmund Campion, when he became a Catholic and went to Europe, trained for the Jesuit priesthood. What you have to understand is that, that when you trained for the Jesuit priesthood, if you volunteered to, 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 join, to join the English mission, you were basically knowing you were condemning yourself to death. And not really death, but probably seven years of excruciating torture before death. And then when you were finally killed, you were killed by means of hanging, drawing and quartering, which is one of the most barbaric ways of putting anyone to death. These men knew that before setting out. Edmund Campion and companions left for England in 1580. They travelled by land, which means that they stopped in Milan. And the great St. Charles Borromeo, who recognised sanctity in people, asked, invited these Jesuits, young Jesuits, to stay with him on their way. It's almost certainly there that Edmund Campion and his companions were given copies of St. Charles Borromeo's Testaments to bring over with them. St. Charles, um, uh, there's a possible connection with Shakespeare with, with Edmund Campion. They might have been staying in the same part of Lancashire for a short time before Campion's um, arrest. He was only in England for under a year before he was arrested. You understand as well, they didn't have all these spying we've got now with the internet, but they had a, but Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth had a very, very elaborate spy network uh, of people that pretended to be, be converts to the faith. And then you had people you know, going to the English College in Rome, feigning uh, vacations to the priesthood. So the, the spies were everywhere. And of course, there was an old fashioned trick of blackmail that set Catholics up so they're blackmailable, and as long as they give information, then their secret's safe. All the dirty, sordid tricks of espionage. So, Campion was betrayed, arrested, tortured, and hung on, quartered, hung on, and quartered. Let's I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I'm going to give you, by the way, if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're squeamish about things, cover your ears. <laughs> then, as stipulated in the judge's sentence, Campion was hanged, but taken down while still alive and conscious. He was then laid out flat in full view of the crowd, stripped naked, castrated, and cut open. His internal organs were removed one by one and held aloft for the crowd to see before being thrown into the fire. The last organ to be removed was the heart, which by this time had hopefully and mercifully stopped beating. The body was then decapitated and hacked into four pieces. At some stage in this gory and gruesome process, some of Campion's blood had spattered on a young man in the crowd. Converted instantly, and therefore miraculously, it is said, by the touch of the saint's sanctified blood, the young man, Henry Walpole, gave up his law of practice and followed in the hallowed footsteps of his master's mentor, becoming a priest of the Society of Jesus, before returning to England to face arrest, torture, and the same gruesome death he had witnessed at Tyburn, being hanged, drawn, and quartered on April the 7th, 1595, thereby following Campion to heaven. Both men were canonised in 1970 by Pope Paul VI. 
It is appropriate to end this chapter as we began with some lines from Henry Walpole's poem in homage to Edmund Campion, the words of one saint in praise of another. You thought perhaps when learned Campion dies, his pen must cease, his sugared tongue be still, but you forgot how loud his death it cries, how far beyond the sound of tongue and quill. You did not know how rare and great a good it was to write his precious gifts in blood. His hurdle draws us with him to the cross. His speeches there provoketh us to die. His death doth say, his life is but our loss, his martyred blood from heaven to us doth cry. His first and last, and all agree in this, to show the way that leadeth unto bliss. Blessed be God, who lent him so much grace. Thanked be Christ, that blessed his martyr so. Happy is he that sees his master's face. Cursed are they that walk to work his woe. Bounden we be to give eternal praise to Jesus' name, who such a saint did raise. And finally, some of a subtle, another Jesuit, not as well known as Edmund Campion as should be, I, I don't have too much time to speak about him, um, but again, a convert to the faith, uh, a great poet. And you have to understand that, that this was before the age of the novel. Poets were the best sellers. Robert Southall's poetry was read by Queen Elizabeth. His works were well known. Shakespeare alludes to Sir Robert Southall's uh, poetry in several of his plays, Merchant of Venice, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, King Lear. Could say more about that, I don't have time. But in 1578, having converted to Rome at the age of 16, having converted to Catholicism, at the age of 16, he walks to Rome from Northern Europe. Becomes a Jesuit priest. And in 1586, arrives in England. Now, unlike St. Edmund Campion, he's not arrested fairly soon. He actually manages to stay free for seven years. Most of it actually in the heart of the beast in London itself. He arrives, um, in 1586, in the year in which St. Margaret Clitheroe was martyred. I want to say something about her. The, 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 the Queen Elizabeth was obviously, she was reluctant to make martyrs of women who uh, would just evoke more sympathy. So there were only of the 40 canonised martyrs of England around, only three of them were women. Uh, one of them, St. Anne Lyon Shakespeare, who was certainly new and who was certainly wrote about in one of his poems. But Sir Margaret Clitheroe, Pearl of York, as she's known, uh, was a convert. Amazing how these in times of peril, when it's perilous and deadly to become Catholics, these people become Catholics. And she starts a network basically of hiding priests so that masses can be said, homeschooling children to save them from the Protestant education. And they're not gonna, obviously you're not going to hang wrong well poor to a woman, even the English are not that barbaric. But what, what they sent us, the other, the other two English martyrs, uh, St. Adeline and St. Margaret Ward, were, um, were uh, hanged. But St. Margaret Clitheroe, well, they, she was pressed to death. And that me, me, meant they, they, they were going to strip her naked, but by the mercy of God and her pleading and pleading of others, they, they allowed her to remain modest. But she was placed on the ground with a stone under the face of her spine. Um, and then weights were put on her until she was literally crushed to death. And the, I'll come into these number of minutes now, but quite a number of minutes before she was actually killed. Uh, you can actually visit the shrines of her in York. I've done it. Um, the, her home and her hand, two separate places in York. So, um, Shakespeare, sorry, Sir Robert Southall managed to remain free from his arrival in 1586 to his arrest in 1592. He's betrayed, betrayed by someone called Anne Bellamy, uh, who was raped by uh, uh, Richard Topcliffe, Queen Elizabeth's 
main torturer during his interrogation. She became pregnant by him and he arranged for a, you know, a respectable marriage for her in return for information, including the whereabouts of St. Robert Southern. And I'm going to finish, and he was executed exactly the same way as Edmund Cambie and the Cambion, hanging drawer on a quartering, except there were a great many sympathisers in the crowd, and when he was hanging, his last words, by the way, were the words of Christ. He was 33 years old, same age as Christ. Final words were into, 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 into your hands, O Lord. They commended by spirit. Um, but people in the crowd rushed forward when he was being hanged and tugged at his legs to break his neck and kill him before that he was dead when they started disemboweling him, etc. Act of mercy. Now I've got to finish with the conclusion of the book here because I think this sums it up better than I can. Let me finish here. So the epilogue of the book is called Ever Old, Ever New. If the world hates you, know ye that it hath hated me before you. If you had been of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember my word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Gospel of St. John, of course. These words from John's Gospel remind us that the more things change, the more they remain the same. In every generation, there is a choice presented to each of us. We must choose between the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the age, the Heilige Geist or the Zeitgeist. We can't have it both ways. If the world hates us, it is because it hates Christ. If the world loves us, it is our worldliness that it loves. The world loves its own, but we are not called to be owned by the world any more than we are called to own it. We are not its, and it is not ours. Nor do we own our lives. If we did, death couldn't take what is ours away from us. We don't own our lives, we owe them. We owe our lives and cannot avoid paying the debt. The debt is paid in loving the being who loved us into being. We are called to love as we are loved. We are called to love our God and our neighbour. It is indeed no mere coincidence that the same chapter of St John's Gospel, in which we are warned that the world will hate us as it hates Christ and will persecute us as it persecutes Christ, is the chapter in which we are given the commandment that we love one another as he has loved us. How are we to do this? He tells us, greater love than this no man hath, than a man lay down his life for his friends. The heroes of the Catholic Reformation are those who showed this greatest love of all. They laid down their lives for their friends, which included those friends who were their enemies. We should remember, of course, that the word martyr means witness, which means that one can die for one's faith without being killed for it. In this sense, even those witnesses to the faith who died of natural causes, such as Ignatius Loyola, Charles Borromeo, or Teresa of Avila, were martyrs. They witnessed to the faith by laying down their lives in self-sacrificial service, imitating Christ in dying to themselves that others might live. The heroes laid down their lives for Christ and his church rather than accommodate themselves to the secularism of the state and its imposition of a state religion. Then as now, heroes will not render unto Caesar that which is God's. The heroes laid down their lives for Christ and his church rather than accommodate themselves to modernism. Then as now, heroes don't want a church that will move with the world but a church that will move the world. Ignatius Loyola and Francis Xavier, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, Charles Borromeo and Pius V, these heroes of the Catholic Reformation moved the world. It was changed by them. It would never be the same again. 
it was better than it was because they laid down their lives as Christ had laid down his. Thomas More and John Fisher, Edmund Campion and Robert Southall, these heroes of the Catholic Reformation offer the ultimate sacrifice that saints have always made in the face of secular tyranny for the time of the Roman Empire, to the time of the Soviet Empire, and to the time of whatever new empires the 21st century might erect against Christ and his church. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo, echoing words that must have been said by Thomas More and all the other martyrs living down the ages. So do I, said Gandalf, echoing the voice of conscience that encourages every saint. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Life is not easy. It's not meant to be easy. God knows it's not easy and shows it's not easy by giving his only son to show us just how difficult it is. True heroes do not walk away from the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow and suffering, seeking an easier path. True heroes take up their cross and follow their master, the hero of heroes, knowing that they have nothing to fear from the world because the hero of Calvary has already conquered. True heroes fight the long defeats, ever old as it is ever new, against the spirit of a world that always seems to be winning but never actually wins. They fight the long defeat of history knowing that the final victory is with the Lord of history, because history is his story. More to the point, and most importantly, true heroes know that life is short for mortal men, and that the victory is won or lost for each of us and by each of us within the very little time we have. The end of the world is sooner than we think. It is for us the moment that we die, which could be tomorrow. It is therefore pointless to concern ourselves with the way the world is going or how powerful are the forces of evil. The wise know that the forces of evil are always powerful. They are much too powerful for us, but they are not too powerful for Christ. If we stay with him through thick and thin, we will win the hero's victory and the hero's reward when we die. We live in dark and doom-laden days. So did the heroes of the Catholic Reformation. So do all men in all ages in this fallen and broken world. We cannot choose the time in which we live, but we can choose the way that we live in the time that is given us. This is the choice. This is the challenge. This is the hero's quest. Thank you. I would like to ask a question. Okay, that, yeah, that, that must be the answer is yes. It's 8.10, I don't want to keep people too long, and I want to make sure you have more than enough time to spend more money than you can afford before you pass the book table. <laughs> So we'll have, we'll have 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of questions, we have 10 minutes of Q&A, beginning with Father. Father. By the way, by the way, before you ask your question, I just want to, just want to confess how stupid I am. Okay. Well, I've been looking down at this little small watch the whole time. I've just finished my talk, and there's a great big clock right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't pay attention to that clock either. <laughs> so please, Father, yes, question. We are experiencing a cancel culture, a woke culture, a culture where we have a very few dictating the morality of our culture. And that morality is changing from day to night. I mean, everything is completely opposite. Um, is that
that typically the response um, from people? Well, I know the answer to this. Um, other cultures have experienced this as well. Yes. The oligarchy, the few who are going all out to change the morality of the people and basically trading good for evil. Yes, indeed. I mean, we, we saw it certainly the last century was, was almost defined by that with the various totalitarian regimes, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, Communist China, Fascist Italy, um, where um, there's a whole new morality, the church, uh, Christianity is seen to be evil, the communist perspective, the opiate of the people, from the Nazi perspective, the, the religion of the weak, um, so, and the French Revolution before that, and, and these times, and all of a sudden, England was a completely Catholic country, and within 20 years, the mass was banned. And to be a priest was punished by death. That's a cancel culture. But what I've got a new book coming out, actually, I think, I think it came out today. I haven't seen it yet, but today was the release date, anyway. And it's called Faith of Our Fathers, A History of True England. And, and the glorious thing about, about that is you see the whole sweep of English history. And after 300 years of relentless persecution, the first 150 years of which priests and laity were put to death. So from the 1530s to the 1680s, there were executions. And then for the next 100, 150 years, from the 1680s to 1529, there was just all sorts of persecution against the church on, on, on legal basis. The church, the Catholics were just not had, I mean, the whole idea that, 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 that only one class of people had been persecuted, the Catholics in England were, were treated as bad as any, any people in any other country. Um, and it was not until 1829, almost exactly 300 years after Henry VIII put Thomas More uh, and John Fisher to death, that Catholic emancipation happened. But then what do you see? A great Catholic revival. Um, the, uh, in my book I give the figures for new Catholic churches being built, new Catholic schools opening, the number of Catholics in England, the number of Catholics in Catholic, Catholics in Catholic schools. Um, and that carried on between the two world wars. There were a, a, an average of over 10,000 adult converts to the Catholic Church in England alone, year after year. So, you know, uh, there were times when things do not seem to be going well, and it's easy to despair and think this is permanent, and history shows that it isn't. And the other key thing is that, that we don't have to defeat evil because evil is always self defeating. And we said about revolution devouring their own. This current world culture is completely unsustainable, completely self-destructive. It might be messy, might be very deadly, might be nasty, and may take down innocent victims. It is taking down innocent victims already, <laughs> through abortion and other things. Um, but it's not sustainable, it's not going to triumph, it's going to destroy itself. The culture of death is suicidal. All we have to do is be true to the truth of the gospel. For the little short time we're here, on active service, a soldiers of Christ. And we don't have to worry about the future because for God, in his omnipresence, there is no future. Everything is present. He already knows how things are going to be. Yeah. You spoke about the gruesome um, manner of death that was imposed upon the Catholics. When Queen Mary was ruling, did she do something similar or what did that look like with the Protestants? Yeah, that's a very good point. Again, in my new book, the Catholic Mary Tudor. I, I do, however, sort of have a little dig at Protestant history because they talk about Bloody Mary and Good Queen Bess. Well, my, my title was Mary Tudor and Bloody Bess, so let's say a little bit of response there. Um, but yes, Mary Tudor was a very devout Catholic and she honestly believed, and I think wrongly, that, um, that she needed to take drastic action to wipe out the heresies in England and, and she she certainly put a number, it wasn't a huge number, I think it was a hundred and something, too many, uh, Protestants to death by burning, which is also not a very nice way to go. Um, but the point you have to understand that these Protestants, there's no such thing as pluralism in those days. They, this, was, this was a civil war, but what she should have done, because they, they weren't, they weren't going to do anything except fight and be seditious and revolutionary, they, they, she should have just put them into exile. And they would have caused a lot of problems, stirring things up against Catholic England amongst the Protestants in Europe. But that, that's a price you pay. Um, so I don't, I don't approve of the way that she behaved. But the, but the point is, English history only talks about her. It doesn't talk about Henry VIII or Edward VI or Henry VIII or James I. 
etc. Anybody else? Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 a good question. The metaphor, the metaphor I use actually, because the, 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 the progressives believe that everything's getting better, right? There's a golden age in the future ushered in by science. Uh, a certain type of conservative thinks that everything's getting worse. I mean, as yeah, everyone's going to hell, and you know, the world's going to hell, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Um, and then we have these various theories of of cycles in history, and um, there's various philosophers such as Spengler that, that, that hold to that. The, the, what, what my, my new book I'm working on, what I'm, what I'm suggesting, rather than that, is a, it's a tapestry. That, that in every generation you have the bad, Homo superbus, um, the proud man, and then you have Homo beatus or pilgrim man, and you have Anthropos man, the creator, man who sees beauty and wonder. So you have goodness, wickedness, and great beauty as a three threads that run, that run their way through history. The, the dark thread of wickedness is the largest, the thickest, in the sense that it's in terms of political power, it's the one that, that, that's dominating. But again, we, we have to realise that politics isn't what it's ultimately about. <laughs> politics is about fighting for the good, the true and the beautiful in order to attain eternal life, not, not winning the, the, the worldly battle. So, given that Eastern Europe has been slavery for 70 years and coming. Do you, is there any validity to some, some famous uh, talk show host that Eastern Europe may actually be the savior of Europe and the West? Well, it's, that's very really controversial in present circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just say that for me, Hungary and Poland are absolutely the bright lights. Uh, and Regardless of, of the situation in the Russia-Ukraine war, which I'm not going to comment upon, because <laughs> it's just divisive, um, that after 70 years of communism, if you were a realist, you'd have said, well, Christianity's finished. You've broken the living tradition. Like, there's no one alive when the Soviet Union falls in 1990 that remembers a Christian Russia prior to 1917. They're all dead. The thing's been broken. It's gone. You've got rid of the roots, you dug it up by the roots, there's nothing there. And the actual growth in the practice of Christianity and the growth of the Russian Orthodox Church in the last 30 years is quite frankly miraculous. Uh, and also, you know, if we, I, we, can, we can condemn Russia, and I'm happy for us to do that, but we can't condemn Russia as a communist country. For instance, let me give an example that, um, uh, that in Russian high schools, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's classic work, The Gulag Archipelago, the, anti, the actual classic work of anti, of anti, of anti communism, is required reading for every Russian high schooler. And a bridge book, and you know the Gulag Archipelago, it's three thick volumes, where the Russian state asked um, Solzhenitsyn's widow to, to oversee an, author, an authorized one volume edition, which was then compulsory reading in all Russian high schools. So, uh, I mean, and look at the state of public school education in this country with the, with the rise of woke. What, what would we give to have every American high school kid reading uh, the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn? So it's a, it's a complex situation, and none of that is to justify uh, Russian aggression in the Ukraine. But, but we certainly can't, um, we can't just sort of become stereo, looking at things in a stereotypical way, because that's just too, too simplistic. Well, thank you, sir, on that controversial note. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me, as always. Thank you, Father. God bless you.